Conference realignment madness continues with the Pac-12 suing the Mountain West as it takes a fifth school from them. Plus, Brett Favre revealed he has Parkinson's while testifying before Congress, and later we'll hear from the Kansas City Chiefs, George Karloftis. It's Wednesday, September 25th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, our reporter Amanda Krisovich explains the latest on the Pac-12 as it snags a fifth school from the Mountain West. My colleague AJ Perez joins us from Washington, D.C., where he watched Brett Favre's congressional testimony. We're also chatting about life in one of the NFL's most watched teams with Chiefs defensive end George Karloftis. Plus, Warner Bros. Discovery is making fresh claims in its lawsuit against the NBA, and LeBron is pondering a future in broadcasting. First, let's hit the headlines. Vince McMahon attempted to buy back footage from Netflix's docuseries Mr. McMahon ahead of its release. The show, which chronicles McMahon's time as leader of WWE, was announced years ago, but fell into question after allegations of sexual assault and sex trafficking were levied against McMahon. Netflix refused McMahon's request with a docuseries releasing on the streaming platform this morning. 2005 Heisman Trophy winner Reggie Bush is suing his alma mater, USC, for profiting off his name, image, and likeness and not compensating him while he was there and into his NFL career. Ironically, Bush had to forfeit his Heisman Trophy and USC had its 2004 National Championship vacated due to the NCAA ruling that he received impermissible benefits from the school. Bush's Heisman Trophy has since been reinstated. The NFL suspended Chargers safety Derwin James without pay after an illegal hit to Steelers tight end Pat Firemuth. The suspension will last for one game, with the NFL citing repeated violations of playing rules intended to protect the health and safety of players. James is appealing the suspension, saying, I'm trying to get the guy to the ground. I don't feel like I hit him in the head or neck, but we'll look at it. Caitlin Clark's first WNBA playoff game resulted in a 93-69 defeat, but it still drew huge viewership numbers despite competing for attention with NFL games on Sunday. The game averaged 1.8 million viewers despite the Connecticut Sun running away with the game in the fourth quarter. The Fever and Sun play again tonight. Brett Favre's testimony in yesterday's congressional hearing included a stunning revelation. The Hall of Fame quarterback said he was recently diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. The hearing was in relation to the Mississippi welfare scandal, in which about $8 million worth of welfare funds went to projects connected to Favre, namely a volleyball stadium and a drug company he backed. My colleague AJ Perez has been reporting on this entire saga from its early days, and he joins us next. Joined now live from Washington, D.C. by senior reporter A.J. Perez. Welcome, A.J. Hey, thanks for having me back. Uh, Great to have you on. So Brett Favre testified in front of the House Ways and Means Committee and revealed, among other things, that he has Parkinson's disease. You've been following the the legal allegations around him for a long time now. What was your reaction to the news? It wasn't shocking. We uh, we got the embargoed uh, um, testimony, which is common for congressional hearings. We usually those who are covering it or are credentialed to cover it, or you often get these get these uh, kind of basic statements. Now, the people who make these statements and who submit them to the to the committees, they don't always stick to them. But going back to July, when Jake Van Landingham was indicted, he was the last person so far indicted in the Mississippi welfare scandal. He was indicted by the federal federal prosecutors in Mississippi. Um, he was far as business partner with this company called Prevacus that received two of the eight million dollars that was linked to Brett Favre. Uh, he, when he was indicted, there was little rumors started going around. I, I, some of my sources like, yeah, I'm hearing Favre kind of has a health thing going on. And obviously, I, I did some, a little bit of research, but it, it wasn't uh, Parkinson's wasn't what I really heard back in July. But it, 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 it's shocking. It's a, and it's a very sad development. And in my story today, we had, you know, the, there's um, the increased risk of Parkinson's for those who play tackle football, organized tackle football. Um, and that's really kind of that, that was kind of how this this whole hearing started uh, this morning here in D.C. Um, and it kind of went off from there. And it was this is a GOP led committee because it was the House of Representatives, which just has a GOP majority. So it was it, we knew it was going to be kind of a friendly hearing until it got to the questioning from the Democrats. Yeah. And and to get to the the hearing itself. So this was about you know, welfare reform, the need for, for guardrails, as you put in your story around how these funds are distributed. Um, why was far? I mean, Farve is accused of abusing these systems why was he a witness here exactly uh yeah he has uh he didn't know what tanf was back in 2017 when he started looking for the funds now far has never used the word tanf in any of the text messages that 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 we've seen it was just you know state funding or grants and that's what he testified to today so yeah that is a very obvious question owen why is somebody who is accused of getting access to these funds who are supposed to go tanf funds only a couple hundred dollars a month, and like ninety-five, around ninety-five percent of the applicants in Mississippi who have to be well below the poverty line 
qualify. Like literally only 5% of the people who, who actually apply for these funds, only a couple hundred dollars a month. And you have to make so far below the poverty line. And Mississippi is the poorest state in, in, in the U.S. So it was kind of, it wasn't odd. And it, it was brought up by Representative Sanchez from California and others. Like, why is Brett Favre, who's accused of this, not, he hasn't been charged criminally. He's only a defendant in a lawsuit trying to recover this money. Why is he the one up here? And it was kind of like, it was, you know, the GOP was very, very, very kind to him today. Uh, we have we, we, one of the, one of the latter, the latter representatives from Utah was talking up his, his days at Utah or Utah State. I can't remember which one. So it's kind of like it was like a big buddy buddy thing for the GOP side. And afterwards, he signed a Packers jersey. He signed other autographs. It was like it was. And then he didn't talk to us afterwards. So uh, so that was how, uh, you know, that, that this is how it went. It was over three hours. And, you know, there were others on there, including the head of the, the, um, the head of the ACLU from Mississippi, who, you know, who actually you'll see in my my story is coming out. Yeah, it'll come out. It'll it'll be published by this time this comes out. It kind of really delves into this. Like, why why was Far an expert witness on TANF reform when, if there had been reform before, he would not have access to that money? Anything else notable from his testimony or from how he was treated by various members of Congress? Uh, no, there, even 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 the you know the Democrats were you know it was it was a very well attended hearing. I've I've attended hearings here without big stars like Brett Favre. Where you get you know seven or eight representatives, and it could be a very important topic. This is an important topic, but TANF hasn't changed since 1996, when 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 Bill Clinton signed the bill. It was a Republican bill, sponsored bill that got through both chambers of the House and the Senate back in '96, and Bill Clinton signed it. There's no oversight, and there and there's been talk for the last you know, almost three decades now to give at least the federal government the ability to audit the, the states and to, and uh, to get the money back from them. If it's misspent, it still hasn't happened. And this and this hearing probably won't change that. And there's so much gridlock here in D.C., it's probably not going to make any difference. Favre, as we've been discussing, you know, is uh, accused of, you know, abusing the system, essentially, uh, which if you want the details, read AJ's many stories on this. Um, any uh, developments in terms of his legal status? No, no, there's uh, we we're, we're back in uh, July, we reported that like early October is like that's the last chunk of funds that Barb was associated with that went to this drug company, Prevacus, concussion drug company. And obviously he used that concussion drug company as, you know, him, he actually mentioned him losing money in that as he mentioned his Parkinson's disease diagnosis. Um, that, so the, the, the window to charge is only five years. So we're almost against that. This, that goes back to 2019. We got to add five to it wherever we're, we're there. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, now there's, there's other possibilities where, you know, he could be you know, other stuff can be going going on be, behind the scenes. We don't really know about uh, that. But so, but right now he's only a defendant in a lawsuit. He has been charged criminally, and the clock is ticking to whether he will be charged uh, criminally. Basically, AJ Perez, thanks for tracking all the twists and turns here, and thanks for joining us on the show. Yeah, no problem. A medical test can reveal your body's biological age, which can show if you are aging prematurely. Better nutrition has been shown to reverse one's bio-age. My hope of living longer and healthier is why I take Field of Greens. Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. .com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com. Fieldofgreens.com. Detroit Lions head coach Dan Campbell said that he had to move after his address was made public in a Snapchat post and people started showing up at his house after games to yell at him. His address was revealed by a classmate of his teenage daughter, which led to people showing up in his driveway hours after the Lions lost to the 49ers in last season's NFC Championship game. There are other similar incidents around that time. Athletes and head coaches live very privileged lives, but that doesn't make it any less disturbing when people feel at liberty to show up at your home for some verbal abuse, especially when you have a public schedule and everyone knows when you're out of town. If you wouldn't do it to someone you actually know, maybe don't do it to your team's head coach. Sticking with the NFL, pop quiz, Patrick Mahomes has the top-selling jersey among Kansas City Chiefs. Who is second? 
You might assume the answer is Travis Kelsey, but that wouldn't make for a very interesting quiz. Just ahead of the tight end is Chiefs kicker Harrison Butker, who is 11th in the NFL overall, according to the NFLPA. Butker is benefiting from some controversial statements he made at a convention speech at Benedictine College about women in the workplace. After the initial backlash, some fans stood up for the kicker by buying his jersey. Butker's comments drew the ire of Taylor Swift fans, who have become a core constituency for the Chiefs, and the LA Chargers made fun of him in their schedule release video by showing him working in a kitchen. All I will say here is that I am proud to work with the women on our team, and we need more of them in sports media, not fewer. Warner Bros. Discovery is claiming that the NBA deliberately put provisions in its contract with Amazon that made it impossible for WBD to match the offer. To review, the NBA signed a package of media rights deals worth $76 billion with Disney, NBC, and Amazon. As its longtime media partner, WBD, which owns TNT, had matching rights on the Amazon offer, but what that means exactly was a point of ambiguity before the deal and is the central question in a lawsuit. WBD claims that the NBA put traps in the contractual language with Amazon specifically designed to block WBD from matching. Specifically, the company claims that the Amazon offer required that NBA games be on a platform that also includes NFL games, which Amazon has, and WBD does not. The WBD also claims that it was asked to fund a $3.2 billion escrow requirement when the NBA knew it had just under $3 billion in cash, and that there was no guarantee that Amazon would actually be held to the same requirement. There was similar language, according to WBD, that allowed the NBA to terminate the deal if the broadcaster's credit were downgraded below a certain rating, which is a much bigger risk for WBD than Amazon. Whatever the court thinks here, if the NBA wanted to be in business with WBD, it would have made a deal work. The league picked Amazon, and it's going to do everything it can to hold on to that pick. The tug of war between the Mountain West and Pac-12 continued yesterday as Utah State agreed to leave the former for the latter. That makes Utah State the fifth Mountain West school to leave for the Pac-12 in the past two weeks. With Utah State headed to the Pac-12, UNLV is now exploring its options between the two conferences. UNLV had initially agreed to return to the Mountain West, pending that all eight of the remaining schools agreed to stay after the exodus of Fresno State, Boise State, San Diego State, and Colorado State. And the Mountain West wasn't the only conference having a turf war with the Pac-12. Memphis, Air Force, and Tulane all committed themselves to stay with the AAC after the Pac-12 had discussions to add the schools to its roster. Each school cited murky revenue projections from the Pac-12, travel costs, and high exit fees from the AAC when turning down the Pac-12. And finally, the Pac-12 is reportedly having discussions with Gonzaga over a potential exit from the West Coast Conference. While no deal has been made yet, the Zags have entertained offers to leave the West Coast Conference for years. My colleague Amanda Kristovich has been tracking down every detail on this, and she joins us next. I'm joined now by front office sports reporter Amanda Kristovich. Welcome, Amanda. Hey, how's it going? Great. How are you in these whirlwind times? Um, you know, I have been staring at a lot of screens and on the phone pretty much for the last 24 hours straight, but um, you know, it's kind of fun. All right. Yeah. Well, now prepare to digest all of that into, you know, <laughs> five minutes of conversation. Uh so uh, super quick review. The Pac-12 um, has lured first Boise State, San Diego State, Colorado State, and Fresno State over to join mm -hmm. them. And as of very recently, Utah State as well. Um, so obviously things are, are uh, not great between the Pac-12 and the Mountain West, which one seemed like two conferences that could essentially join together as one. Um, and now the Pac-12 is suing the Mountain West. So what is the nature of that lawsuit? Yeah, so the lawsuit is trying to challenge a stipulation that's in that one-year football scheduling agreement uh, that the Pac-12 and Mountain West signed and that, you know, they're currently carrying out. So, like, it's you have to remember, you know, how awkward this is, right? Like, while well, all this, you know, um, are, all these arguments are happening off, off the field, on the field, they're still playing football together. Um but the stipulation basically said that there it's like there's like a $10 million fee that a damage fee that the Pac-12 has to pay the Mountain West in the event that the Pac-12 poaches a school. Um, and there's like an escalator. Um, and so basically, if you add those four schools plus a fifth school, Utah State, which the court documents themselves actually confirmed that the Pac-12 is adding Utah State. Um, it's a $55 million fee. And so the Pac-12 is suing the Mountain West to get out of that. Um, they're arguing on antitrust grounds that they 
sort of, you know, were under duress when they signed this agreement that they were being exploited by the Mountain West because they were desperate. If you remember their situation, um, they were desperate for, you know, anybody to play them so that they could continue to exist, essentially, and that they agreed to these terms that, you know, upon reflection, violate antitrust law, according to them. So that's the lawsuit. It was filed today, you know, just a couple hours ago, and it's the latest in this sort of long and messy breakup between uh, these two conferences that could have been a very happy marriage. Obviously not a lawyer here. That argument seems very much like this deal was the first part of this deal was good for us in the part of the deal that's bad for us. It turns out, you know, we were having a bad day. We shouldn't have said the things we said and we want to take it all back. Um, I guess we'll see what the courts think about that. But um, is the PAC 12, like how damaging, obviously I think on some level they'd have to be prepared to pay all this money. How damaging would it be to the PAC 12 to have to pay up? I mean, you know, it, it would pretty much drain that $65 million war chest that they got from, you know, the 10 departing members from that other lawsuit. Um, you know, a few months ago, that was sort of like the divorce agreement um, from those original 10 departing members. So, you know, they had that extra money laying around. They could pay it. Obviously, they use some of it for the scheduling partnership, just like general fees. Um you know, I can't speak to like how much exactly they have in the bank, but it certainly helps. I, I wouldn't say that they couldn't afford uh, the $55 million price tag if they had to. But, you know, obviously they don't want to pay it. And, uh, you know, who would? And, and they think that they have legal standing to challenge it in court, even though, yes, you know, the, the, the PAC 2 and previous commissioner, George Klievkov, signed uh, the agreement. I have a copy. Front Office Sports has a copy. We obtained it several months ago with the help of, um, you know, my fabulous colleague, AJ Perez. So, you know, they agreed to it, but they think that there's a way that they can get out of it. And that's what they're trying to do. And the Mountain West was already kind of spending this money or attempting to, right, to keep the schools that they still do have. What's the status of that? Yeah. So um, as of mon on Monday, the Mountain West pretty much spent the whole day um, trying to get its existing members to sign um, not a full grant of rights agreement, but like a written agreement that they would stay in the conference that could serve as like an on-ramp to a longer grant of rights that would run like through 2031 through uh, the CFP, um, uh, the CFP media rights agreement, because that's kind of like when all the next round of the big deals end. Um, they were somewhat successful, like, um, you know, a source told me to expect some sort of announcement um, about this agreement that, as you mentioned, did include financial incentives for, uh, you know, I don't know specifically, but like, presumably the schools that might be considering leaving, right? Um, like Air Force, like UNLV, like U Utah State. Um, then around the time I was expecting that announcement to come out, the reports started to trickle in about Utah State refusing to sign the agreement and going with the Pac-12 instead. And then it was like radio silence for the rest of the night. Um, and most of this morning, um, until this lawsuit was filed, it became official that Utah State's going to the Pac-12, um, at least according to the court documents. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know the status of this Mountain West agreement at this point. I reached out to the conference. They didn't have an immediate comment as of um, a couple hours ago on Tuesday. All those schools that left the Pac-12 left because they saw greener pastures elsewhere, mostly in the forms of larger media deals. What's the, the draw of all the schools that are now coming into the Pac-12? Presumably, it's the same thing. It's a bigger media deal. Um, you know, in some cases, it's ego as well. I think um, Boise State and San Diego State specifically have, you know, it's no secret they've always been kind of interested in the Pac-12. And sort of the iteration of the Pac-12 that had a lot of private schools, schools like Stanford and Cal and USC, kind of turned up their nose at, um, at those two programs. And uh, so they jumped at the opportunity to, uh, to, to join the PAC 12. I think there's this hope 
that the the branding of the Pac-12 is going to be good for them from a college football playoff perspective and a media rates perspective. Uh, I'm not sure that it's going to be of much more value than the Mountain West would have been at this point. Um, there's a lot of sort of reports and whispers and conversation that the college football playoff is not going to consider the Pac-12 a power conference, you know, that that status is dead in the water. And so um, I'm not sure they're going to be getting that value that they thought they were going to be getting. We saw reports on Wednesday that Gonzaga is in advanced talks, perhaps, with um, with the Pac-12. Do we know anything beyond that? You mean that? Monday. <laughs> oh, oh god all right sorry <laughs> on a day this week uh we heard that gonzaga was talking to the pac-12 yeah what, what do we know there yeah i mean that was a very strange report um that just sort of appeared in the middle of the day on monday when all this was going down that gonzaga was on the way to the pac-12 um i can confidently say according to my sourcing that that is not the case um as you mentioned, there have been discussions. I'm not sure I would even characterize them as advanced discussions. Um, you know, Gonzaga would make sense from a football or excuse me, from a basketball standpoint, but because they don't have an FBS football program or literally any football program, um, they don't count towards that eight school minimum that the Pac-12 needs. So if the Pac-12 were to add them, that would be after they get their eight school minimum, right? Like it would be like a cherry on top of the cake. So yes, they have talked. No, there has been no official offer, no official application, nothing of that nature. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it still happened, though. But that would just be, you know, after this sort of eight team situation gets resolved. Amanda Kristovich, thanks for untangling all this and reminding me what day of the week it is. And thanks for joining us on the show. <laughs> I barely know myself. <laughs> Up next, George Karloftis plays for the Kansas City Chiefs, who are at the center of the NFL world, both on and off the field. They're going for a Super Bowl three-peat, while the world's biggest pop star watches on. Karloftis himself has an interesting background. He grew up in Greece, where people don't generally play football, and he could be in line for a huge payday if he keeps performing at a high level. We talked about all that and more, and that conversation is coming up next. I'm joined now by Kansas City Chiefs defensive end, George Karloftis. Welcome, George. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you on. So, started the season 3-0. and What's what's the beginning of the season been like, you know, with the, the pressure of the three-peat kind of lingering in the background? Yeah, I mean, that's not that's not really our concern, the, the three-peat right now, just kind of taking one week at a time and kind of building off of what we did last week. Uh, you know, kind of just taking that next step every week, fixing what we need to fix and just keep on getting better. Honestly, you know, it's the first time since I've been here that we've been three and Oh, so it's awesome. I think we just got to keep it going, keep on getting better. And uh, yeah, just keep the ball rolling. You were mic'd up, I believe for week 17 of last year against the Bengals. That's what was right, that experience yeah. like to have, you know, your, everything you say potentially broadcast to the public? <laughs> For me, that that specific game, I actually forgot because they text you like a few days before or whatnot. Uh, hey, you're mic'd up. And I was like, oh, OK, you know, that's fine. Um, then I forgot. I think maybe I told a couple people, but I forgot kind of in the moment. And you're so engulfed in the game and you just kind of, you know, it's you and it, it's real. And I think that's why people really like the whole mic'd up series, not just from the Chiefs, but throughout the league, because it's real. It's raw. It's I mean, obviously it's edited, but. You know, it's 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 really what goes on and what's said during the game, and it, it, it's awesome for the fans and for for people that are really close to me to be able to see that 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 side of me, I guess. Yeah, and it's cool to be able, to, yeah, to get the the you know selected but raw audio. Yeah, um, exactly. How is that? What's the process of you know be you being chosen to for you know to wear that mic? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know what what exactly goes into it. You know, our, one of the people from our media team or our communication team will, uh, will reach out to me um, via text and just be like, "Hey, are you are you okay with being mic'd up? We want to do kind of a feature on you or whatnot." And I was like, "Yeah, that sounds great." And that's really what goes on to it. You know, I was actually mic'd up for the Bengals my rookie year too. We ended up losing that game, so it wasn't as uh, as happy of a result as uh, clinching the division, but. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely pretty cool to be, to be mic'd up and, uh, you know, to, to have some success and win the game is awesome. If, if I'm correct in this, you lived in Greece for the first 13 years of your life. Had That's you right. played football before coming to this country? Not at all. Yeah. I learned, no. learned everything, uh, when I moved here to, in Indiana. Did you feel like, you know, even, I mean, 
14, still pretty young, but th that you had a, a lot of catching up to do of uh, compared to the people you're playing with? Definitely at first, not, not anymore. I mean, now it's just, you know, everybody's, you know, at the, at the professional level, you know, so it's at, at first I didn't know very simple things like how to get in a stance or what a first down or just basic rules, you know, just not growing up with a game that I'd venture to say almost all Americans would know just because it's like this, this country sport, you know, just knowing basic rules, like a, like a touchdown. So I had to learn all that stuff. And, and, you know, after I'd say three, three years, I was kind of fully ingrained and I, you know, kind of became obsessed with the game and um, really started to learn everything and study it and caught up. And, uh, you know, you get to the NFL and actually it's funny enough. I feel like uh, a lot of the guys didn't start playing, until maybe they got to, to high school, uh, you know, just everybody obviously has a different um, path to get to the NFL, but a lot of guys didn't start till their freshman year of high school. Um, some guys even in college, other guys start from when they could walk, really. So it just depends. And it's kind of awesome to see uh, in the league kind of everybody coming together for one common goal from all different walks of life. Yeah, and no, that's actually, I find that kind of encouraging just because, I mean, some sports get serious so early when I mean, you have one. Right. 12 year olds who are like already at a very high level in like soccer and baseball. Yeah. The whole, the whole thing with, uh, with football is like, it's a, it's a sport that relies so much on like raw natural athleticism that, you know, uh, a guy can get recruited to college and get a full ride scholarship off not having played ever before. And, uh, the coaches, you know, throughout football are just, are just so good and have so much faith that, you know, I could teach this guy basically from scratch and mold him into the player uh, that I think he can be. And I want him to be, you know, from a coach's perspective. So that's, that's pretty cool to see, you know, you know, I, I, we had guys that even at Purdue, but guys throughout the league that just now that, that just started playing in college, but you know, now they have the, the player pathway program and you see guys, some guys have had success with that uh, where they just start playing, you know, maybe like this year. So it's pretty cool. And I'm just curious, what's what are the big sports in Greece? What's the sports culture like there? Uh, soccer, for sure. Um, the biggest, uh, followed by basketball, and then just a mixture of a lot of different things after that. Uh, did you have a, a you know, a sports path you thought you were going to go down before you went to football? Definitely. Um, <laughs> uh, growing up, I played water polo. Uh, I was on the national team uh, and, until I was 13, so I was kind of on that that track, if you will, to, to, to follow maybe, uh, you know, I was 13, I was still pretty young, but I wanted to be a professional water polo player. That was my dream. That was my goal. Uh, obviously they didn't really have that in Indiana. So it was kind of tough when, uh, our family moved, but, uh, you know, that, that was kind of my goal. I always knew I wanted to be a professional athlete to a certain extent and a capacity and just, uh, to see kind of where life's taking me is, uh, is pretty cool when you, when you take back and, uh, take a step back and reflect. Yeah. And of course, and as you mentioned, you went to Purdue, um, and I guess you were leaving kind of as the, some of the bigger changes in, in college sports yeah. were starting to take hold, like NIL conference realignment. Yeah. Um, but I'm just curious to get your perspective on, yeah, how that landscape is changing. Yeah, it's changing pretty drastically, actually. You know, just talking to my brother, uh, he's at Purdue. He's one of the one of the middle linebackers over there. Uh, just to see how much has changed. You know, I, it's not that far that I'm removed from college. You know, I, I my last season was 2021 or 2024, so three years. And it's changed. I mean, it's it's night and day. I guess my last semester, uh, NIL was first uh, instated when when I was in college, and you know, I you know made a little bit of money, but nothing really sub substantial, maybe enough to pay for some groceries and whatnot. Uh, but now guys are making like real money and this, the transfer portal that, and all that kind of stuff has changed. So it's definitely, it's definitely a big change and uh, I'm not in it. So I'm not ex exactly familiar with it. Uh, but you know, everything happens for a reason, I guess. And for players like your brother, do you think, I mean, not necessarily him specifically, but do you think that might start to change um, the calculation of, you know, when you, you, you know, uh, put yourself up for the draft and then certainly, you know, people are making all sorts of calculations around the transfer portal. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, do you think you're going to start to feel those changes at, in the NFL? I don't know. I think every situation is different. Every player is different. Uh, you know, there's unique situations. I mean, obviously I think if you're, if you're ready to go to the NFL in, in terms of your ability and as a player, 
I think it's a no brainer to take that next step, but that that's just for me. You know, I can't tell someone else what they, they can and should do. Uh, but, you know, I think, I think it certainly could, you know, if there's a, if, if there's a quarterback or a guy that's making a whole bunch of money that, you know, might not have all the, the requirements or, or whatnot for the NFL that, that the intangibles, I should say, that people are looking for it might be a later round pick or undrafted guy, but it's a, a superstar in college. I think that situation would, uh, you know, make a little more sense to stay. But, you know, just like I said, every situation is different. This year in the NFL, uh, you've as a defensive player, you, you've got one of your your moves has been taken away from you. You can the hip drop tackle is now illegal. Um, yeah. How, how do you think that's you know affected you and, and the game? I, I don't know if it's affected us, really. You know, you go out there, you know, um, and, and you play the way you, you've been coached to play. You know, no, no coach teach the, the hip drop tackle. I mean, you try to get the guy down by any means necessary. Uh, if it happens, it happens. Um, you know, you, you don't want anyone to get hurt by any means. And sometimes it is, you know, you're just trying to get them down. Uh, but, you know, you just do what you're coached to do at the end of the day and the chips fall where they do. If we we're seeing you obviously you're on your rookie deal right now. Uh, we're seeing some pretty huge contracts for defensive ends. Josh Allen just got 150 million over five years, you know, a little over half of that guaranteed. Um, I, I'm just wondering if you're if you're thinking about that stuff. Um, you know, as yeah, it's still early this year, of course, but you know, next off season might be when you start talking to the Chiefs about about your next deal. Uh, is that on your mind at all? Not particularly, no. Um... You know, you can fantasize about everything that could happen, but until that time comes, I'm just really just focused on the next game. We play the Chargers in a few days, and I got to prepare for that. So um, there's not too much time to think about much other than you know the current the current game, the current opponent. Uh, you know, when you get some time off, you're trying to spend it with your uh, you know with your family. For me, my girlfriend, my dog, um, you know that kind of stuff. So yeah, and is that something where? You know, you, you trust your agent essentially to, you know, come in to essence, you when the time comes. In essence, yeah. I, you know, for me, I just control what I can control. I think that's the best, the best way to put it. You know, the best, the best advice I could have for anyone else, uh, you know, is just control what you can control, plug the best you can play, and then everything else will take care of itself. Yeah, no, it's, it, it is. Um, it's, we're an interesting time in the NFL with, you know, certain players holding out. Obviously, Hassan Reddick is still doesn't have a deal. Most players have, you know, found a deal um somewhere um do you feel like i mean i know this isn't something you personally have had to contend with just yet but that um players and their teams are able to kind of like negotiate in good faith around this stuff um you know when when it comes to a player who's you know on a a very team-friendly deal just like i said everybody's situation's uh different and unique uh everybody's wants i can't put myself in someone else's shoes um you know so that i think that's that's kind of that you know just everybody's gonna do what's right for them and their families and uh at the end of the day here we're just trying to win games and this after that we'll just we'll worry about the rest after we win some games um and as someone who you know grew up in europe um how do you feel about the nfl having more and more of a presence there and especially in countries where yeah, soccer is the main sport i think it's awesome you know i think growing the game is is amazing you saw what kind of with uh the 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 nba bringing uh basketball to, to asia and all that stuff that the, their their push in the, in the 80s and 90s and how much that really grew the game uh so i think the nfl started to take somewhat of a similar approach or growing the game you know to, to europe to south america to africa and and, and beyond really um, so I think it's awesome. I think it's great. Uh, just bringing new fans and uh, potentially new players too from all over the world. I think it's it's awesome, and I'm all for it. Would you be for a European division if that ever you know got serious? Yeah, I mean it, it's tough. We played a game in Germany last year. Um, I'm not the guy that makes the decisions. Obviously, that's uh, <laughs> miles miles above my pay grade. But uh, you know, I think. I, I think it's cool if they could figure out a way to do it and do it right, you know, because the, the game that we have in Germany, you know, it's that and then you have a bye week or an extended rest afterwards because uh, it takes a lot out of you to go there and because, you know, Kansas City, it's like a 10 hour flight. So there's a lot of, that goes into it. But I think eventually if they figure out a way to do it, it'd be awesome. All right, George Karloftis, good luck against the Chargers and thanks so much for joining us on the show. Appreciate it. Thank you. 
Before we go, here's LeBron James on the Gojo and Golik show on whether he'd be interested in being an NBA broadcaster after he retires. But Tom Brady's in the booth now. So with yeah. your breakdown, you ever think you, when you're done, you may end up in the booth uh, breaking down basketball? You know, I, I don't know. You know, I definitely love the sport. You know, um, I love basketball. I love football, you know, and I watch it not only as a fan, but also, you know, just breaking down, you know, matchups and things of that nature. I've been, I was brought into sports. When you grow up in Northeast Ohio, listen, you, you grow up in sports, you know? So, um, you know, it'd be great. You know, I see Tom Brady doing it. You know, um, you know, he's been great so far. And uh, we will see, even if it's just a, a guest appearance, you know, one game or two, you know, you know, when I'm done playing. But it's always fun to give back to the game, and, you know, and uh, the game has given me so much. So, you know, if it's basketball, if it's football, if it's whatever, you know, I love I love the word sport, you know, because it's given so much to me and my family and it's only right I give back to it. This term's a little overused, but LeBron's basketball IQ is off the charts. And if he wanted to get behind the mic, either as broadcaster or an alt cast or anything like that, I'd be interested. That's it for today. Share this episode with a friend you think would enjoy it and make sure you're subscribed whenever you tune in. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.